Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, time is short, I'm going to get started. Um, yes. I am uh, Floris Anamat, I'm a service manager at Dutch Open Projects. Um, and I played a, a crucial part in our road to the certification of ISO. Um, I always hated those companies where, there's, where you feel that there's procedures for everything, but somehow during this, uh, during our certification, I, uh, I came to appreciate all the, the, the rules and regulations that are sometimes the base and foundation of a, a well-organized company. Uh, I'm not an ISO certification expert. I'm, I'm not going to take a real, real deep, deep dive. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to uh, show you uh, my experience in obtaining the ISO certification um, and perhaps give you reasons why you should or should not go for certification with your company. Uh, and I'll show you some, some common pitfalls and challenges that we faced. Uh, short thing about DOP. Uh, Company with well over 10 years of experience working with Drupal. I've been working there for five now. Um, we've been through ups and downs like a lot of companies, uh, and there's been some major changes, uh, especially now with us, uh, with our certification, uh, and also moving to uh, leaving our, well, not ancestral, but our, our villa in, uh, in the woods of Leusden to a more business like setting in Amersfoort. Okay, um, what's ISO? Most of you should have an idea, otherwise you wouldn't have been uh, sitting here. Um, uh, it's the uh, International Organization for Standardization, and they think of standards for everything. Um, and think of a standard as a, uh, a, a best way of managing, managing something. So they have standards for, I don't know, food safety, medical devices, and they all get a number. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the 9000 one, and uh, especially the, the 27000 one is interesting. Um, yeah, oh, there, there are certainly other uh, uh, standards, but ISO is one of them well-known and, um, uh, well, well, that's why we chose it anyway. Uh, okay, why would you want to be certified? Um, for us, there were three major reasons. Um, uh, the first reason was we want to, uh, um, uh, we want to enhance our company's image. We want to be known as a company that delivers uh, quality services and um, be, uh, oh, and, and that our customers know that their data is safe with us. Um, and the, the second reason is we want to we hope that it will give us an edge in the market um, for those who will who know the, the tender system competing with them. Sometimes tenders are uh, uh, required. Um, or may give you an edge over uh, potential competitors. Um, the third reason, and which is for me the most important reason, is growing as a company. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, more personnel or more money. Uh, those are important things too. Uh, but maturing as a, a company, um, standardizing our processes, um, and make sure that uh, the things we do, we do it the right way. And, and more importantly even is to reflect on those things, uh, evaluate them, uh, improve on them, and create a, uh, a continuous cycle of learning. Um, and to get to this point, a, a, a thorough cleaning and a critical e attitude towards our own internal processes was needed. There are some more minor benefits. Um, uh, you could become a little bit more efficient, so that, that saves money. Um, 
and for us it's also uh, we're sure that all legal requirements are met. Uh, okay, the, the 9001, uh, which is for quality management, um, and in short, and that's for most ISOs, uh, tell what you do, do what you tell, and prove it. Um, that's how it's, uh, that's the base. Um, and I want to explain it um, by looking at customer surveys. We uh, through the 9001, we're doing those twice a year uh, because we want to measure and we want to know what our most important stakeholders, our customers, uh, what they think of us. Uh, and that's the procedure, we've written it down and that's the, the tell what you do part for the, the ISO. We, uh, we do them, that's the do what you tell and after that we uh, we report on them, we analyze them, we, uh, we evaluate them, and yes. Oh yeah, um, oh, uh, very importantly, we, um, uh, we act on it for next year. The, the, the data we extract from this also ends up in our management review, Yeah, and that's the, oh, before I forget, that's the, also the, the prove it part, because when uh, an external auditor comes and uh, takes a look at, okay, what are you doing? You always need to prove it. And you just saying that you did it, that's not enough. You have to have a, 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 a somewhere, a written record of uh, what you've done and, um, and what you're going to do with that data. Uh, another one is uh, the procedure for uh, official complaints. Um, and it's not like when we weren't certified that we didn't have a procedure for this, uh, but now it's more uh, clear cut. Um, it's obvious for uh, people now, uh, for example, through which channel should you uh, file a, a complaint. Um, it's clear now uh, who is responsible for those complaints. And the complaints also, they also end up in our uh, management review. So it's not something that, okay, someone did a complaint and uh, it's handled and then it's forgotten. No, it's, uh, uh, it's evaluated yearly um, so we can learn from it. Um, okay, very short overview of the 27,000 one. Um, it's not uh, information security. It's uh, it, it also it's it's not all, it's, it's not only about unauthorized access, but it also has to do with uh, unauthorized editing or deleting of data, um, and it's risk based. You're going to uh, categorize all possible uh, risks, uh, assess them, and and think of how you can mitigate them. Uh, and, and after that, same as before, uh, they, they, they end up in a, in, in a management review, uh, and so the cycle of learning continues. Um, and there's this example um, that those risks, you have to keep assessing them because uh, markets change, companies change, uh, and with us, um, there was this risk and, um, about someone could potentially uh, go through to our office and from the, the outside windows look into our screens and look into our computer screens and, and see confidential information. So that's uh, a potential security risk and you have to think of something. Um, but then we, uh, we moved to, uh, to Amersfoort where we're on the first floor. Uh, so that risk was mitigated by that fact and, and uh, now it's, it's, it's okay, it's a low risk. We're not afraid of anyone uh, getting a letter and, uh, and peeking. Um, but that's just an example of how risks change and you should uh, be continuously thinking about, okay, have there been risks uh, altered? Uh, are there things that we should uh, think about? Um, 
We have a very strict clean desk, clean printer, and uh, clear screen policy, uh, which is needed for the 27001. Um, and we have some new procedures, for example, a security instant log. Mm. What we now do is that every potential, and, and I stress potential, security incident is, is logged. Um, that information is analyzed, and again, this comes up in our management review, but it's also uh, input for our um, security awareness training, which we now do twice a year, to create awareness, to make, uh, which is uh, uh, obligatory for uh, every employee of DOP. Um, and we also look at those security incidents, or potential security incidents, so that we uh, stay sharp and we learn from our mistakes or potential mistakes. Uh, okay, okay, okay. When we started with the whole uh, ISO thing, um, it was really overwhelming because there's a couple of documents um, with lots of legal terms and there's so many, many rules to follow that you just don't know where to start. Um, there is one thing that's the same, and that's that they both follow the structure of those 10 chapters. And what we did, and what we had the luxury of, is that we had a, a, a external consultants who helped us, and they basically took us through all those chapters uh, to make sure that every document, procedure, or, or whatever was, was, uh, was met. Um, and that's one thing. And the other thing is that, and that's the, you'll see that at chapter 9 and 10, evaluation and improvement, and that's something I cannot stress enough. Uh, if you have all those documents and procedures, well, good for you, but that's not gonna get you certified. Um, you have to have something in place, a management system, uh, which makes sure that you learn from it, you, uh, take new actions, and you keep a cycle going. Uh, if you don't have that, then uh, uh, you're not going to get certified. Um, yes, uh, which is, uh, that's why I posted this, this, uh, this Daring Circle Plan to Check Act. This is what you're doing. Um, there is also something, oh yeah, I wanted to mention that, there's also the ISO 27002, um, and not to be mistaken as a, as a different certification or something. No, the 27002 is a, uh, it contains a practical examples of all the, the norm elements, as they call them, uh, of the 27001. So it's kind of a, a practical translation guide. Um, I, I do recommend it if you are starting with the 27001, get the 27002 for, uh, uh, to read. Okay, and this is important because uh, when we started we used spreadsheets and, and uh, uh, sort of a logical structure. Uh, one of those external consultants used a, a out of the box management system called uh, Control B, um, and this application contains uh, all our ISO stuff. So all those risks I mentioned, they're in there. All procedures, the the, the reviews, um, uh, even from top down, uh, uh, company strategy translated into KPIs, into tasks, they are all in there, uh, and it makes life real easy. Uh, especially when you have a, an external audit and, and someone is going to start asking you all sorts of questions, uh, it's in here, you'll find it. And even if you don't know exactly, uh, if, if, you, if you just don't know or you're, you're, you're blank, uh, uh, you can ask the auditor, uh, okay, which, which norm are you referencing to? And, and you can search in there and then you'll, you, you'll get there. Uh, this really made life easy for us. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, the audits. There's two kind of audits. There's the uh, the internal audits and the external audits. Um, the internal audits. Um, oh yeah. Okay. The internal audit is where you, uh, all documents are checked. Are they okay? And procedures are checked. And that, that's sometimes done by just conducting interviews with employees. Um, this is something you can do yourself, or you can uh, outsource this. Um, I would recommend uh, do it yourself. Um, we had, uh, we uh, two of us had a training for that. Um, then there's the external audits. Um, they they consist of two phases, and the first the first phase is uh, the, the external auditor. Um, they used to come to your company since since COVID times. That's not always the case. Um, they do a, a, a document check. They look at what management system are you uh, using. Um, they determine the scope. What, what, com what does your company do? And they do some small interviews. And basically, the auditor is trying to answer uh, the question: Does he think that your company is ready for? And has the basics uh, to proceed to phase two. Because in phase two, he's going to take a deep dive into the management system. Is it really working? Is everything as it really, really should be? And more importantly, there's that also that cycle again. Are you measuring, evaluating, and reporting? Um, in our case, both those phases took about a week's time. Short timeline, uh, we started at the end of 2020. Um, in, uh, uh, yes, in May we had the two of us at the internal audit training. Um, some, we did our internal auditing and at the end of uh, 2021, start of 2022, the external audits were taken and we were done. So in our case it took about a year, a year and a half. Uh, other companies could potentially be faster, uh, mistakes were made, um, uh, it also depends I'm guessing, on the size of your company. Um, anyway, this is the time it took us. Uh, challenges and pitfalls, okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's with, with, a lot of pro with other projects, it's the same, uh, because there were two external auditors, uh, four of us working on it, so communication is always an, uh, an issue. Same goes with the, the logical document structure, um, especially at the start, because uh, there are so many files you're, you're creating, updating, um, and, and, which goes hand in hand with version control. Where was the last uh, version of that procedure? Or is it in my mail? Or, um, so that's something we, we struggled with. Uh, very important is uh, time. Because uh, it's not as if uh, your, your boss says, okay, you're gonna do the ISO stuff and you've got all the time in the world. No, you've got your regular job and you're gonna do this next to it. Um, and the last one, which is also very, uh, very difficult, comprehending all those rules. Because when I read them, um, sometimes I thought I understood what was uh, meant, but do I? And uh, that's, that's, that's difficult. But the solutions are uh, well, probably as you would expect. Um, you should have regular meetings just to keep, keep everyone together. Uh, this was, for us, it was mostly during COVID times, but face-to-face -face contact was uh, uh, very, uh, very nice. Um, yeah, the, uh, the control B, out-of-the-box management system. Yeah, if you're gonna go for it, take something like that. Uh, sh sure, you could build something in, in Drupal. Hey, why not? But, um, Control B was, uh, was, a, was a good choice for us. 
Uh, you need upper management support, uh, which is, has to do with the time factor. Um, it's going to take time. Uh, and if they don't take it seriously, then it's going to be real hard. And the last one, which is well, perhaps the most important one, the external consulting. Without those people, um, I would never have understood everything that was in those documents. And I still uh, sometimes go over them and think, oh, what was this again? Um, and and I, I, I can contact them, they help me out. Um, okay, we're almost there. Um, in the end, there's not that, that much red tape. Um, it's not like we're a super formal organization now. But there's necessary procedures and, and just a more short uh, checks. Um, I keep learning every day. Uh, I even I make mistakes. That, that's not a problem. I forgot to uh, measure and report on the on Q1 uh, KPIs. Um, I was way too late. Well, shit happens. Um, you. <coughs> You correct it, you make sure that it's reported, uh, and you, you make sure that it doesn't happen again, so that next time uh, I will be on time, um, and that's the important part, so that you keep learning. Good management system is essential, so enough about that. Uh, some regulations may seem strange and odd, like, like uh, people peeking through your windows, um, well, they're all part of the package. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention, it, it really creates awareness within your uh, company for, uh, in our case, quality and uh, information security. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. oh, this is apparently very hard. <laughs> um, that's it. Does anyone have any questions? to the one, to the person in the external audit. So they, I don't know, if, if, if the external audit comes to your company, they, they're, it's, it's almost like they go with, with a microscope through your company, open every door, and, and, and now they're, it, it's, yeah, we, we did it via Google Meet, we, uh, we talked to them. So I think, to be honest, it made it a bit easier for us. Most of the company employees do work from home. Does that put, you know, does that add to, I guess, the red tape procedures for the safety inspections? I mean, uh, you don't control anymore no. if your, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend sees uh, what you're working on. You, you mentioned people through the windows. I guess yeah. the control is completely gone for people that work from home. Yeah, exactly. Think, so that's more what I meant. Oh. How do you counteract that? No, what, what you try to do is that, that those, uh, the, those awareness trainings we do twice a year, that's where you really try to make sure that everyone knows the importance of this. Um, but in the end, if someone um, uh, nods yes and does no and, and lets everyone look at their screen at home, yeah, we won't know. So, thank you. Uh, Any more? Uh, uh, IPA, IPA uh, which is short for, uh, never mind, IPA, IPA, so if you look at it online, they look like a beer, but yeah, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but if you, if you search for IPA and then Control B, you'll, you'll probably find it. 
I can can surely recommend them. How uh, much hours goes into a process like this for a medium-sized company like ours? Are you who? It's a very good question. Uh, I don't know. It's it's sometimes you're doing this. Uh, there's this three days a week, and and then weeks go by and you do nothing. Um, it, it's uh, no. I would guess. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like a hundred hours more even. In the end, it also depends on how many people is are uh, are working on it. Um, yeah, we're a small company, so I'm not sure, but I think that it could be that the larger the company uh, can sometimes be more difficult to get uh, all processes in uh, uh, in order. That's not quite the answer you were looking for, but it's too, uh, too hard a guess, uh, but thank you. Yes? Yes, um, so it took two years to, to get this certification. What about the maintenance? How, how long is it done? Oh, yeah. Thank you, uh, because that's something I, I, I wanted to tell. Because it's not like, oh, we're done now, we can uh, lie back and uh, everything's done. No. Um, so now we have to, uh, exactly, we have to maintain it. Um, and it's, for me, it's about uh, one or two hours a week. Sometimes I do checks, or some, sometimes a colleague does certain checks or measure stuff. Um, so that's about the time it takes. And this month I'm going to do some new uh, internal audits. They have to be done. Um, uh, all processes uh, should be internally audited uh, every three years. So there's uh, lots of time. Um, and, and there's an external audit in, I think, in a year coming up again. So you keep auditing yourself, an external uh, company keeps auditing you, um, but maintaining is, um, isn't that much, uh, doesn't cost that much time. Is that medium sized organization? Yeah, I, I think we're small. <laughs> <laughs> what is the size of people? It, uh, it's uh, 15, uh, 15, 20 years ago. All of them are <laughs> 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 Almost all of the questions. Okay. Uh, Could you elaborate, elaborate a little bit about the scope of the certifications? Are they about your internal information, your management information, or about the things you do for your clients, the product you, you, you make, you build? Is it about all these things? Or it's about everything. everything. Yeah. We've got security and quality. Exactly. Aim at those aspects. So it doesn't matter if it's our service desk or whether it's our uh, marketing uh, department. All aspects that have to do with quality or uh, information security uh, are are covered. Does it even go into the quality of the product you build uh, from the perspective of your client, uh, your client's manager, other clients? Technical uh, manager. No, it doesn't go that way. Okay, to give my uh, follow up some time, I want to thank you, I want to thank everyone. And, um Ja, want het was bij het vraagteken, dus het maakt er niet meer uit. Oh, okay. Ik had niet eens door, ik kocht niet vragen. Ja, ik heb een vraag. Ja? Is dit ook van jou?
Ja, oké okay, dan. Ja. Ja, ja, ja. Eén uh, filmpje, ja. Eén ja. filmpje. Ja. Ja, dat wil ik. Ik via de HDMI uh, als klaarverbond selecteren. Ah. Uh, welke audio device moet ik nemen? Ik zie die er niet bij staan. Zoom, zoom audio device? Is dat deze? Ik denk het wel. Is het een kastje zoom? Nee, 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 nee. Webcaster? Nee. Webcaster? Nee. Ja, probeer zo eens. Laten ze het gaten overlopen. Ja. Nog een beetje, hè? Ops. Klik. Nu zou, drop solid experience cloud nu zou er geluid moeten afkomen. Nee. Ja. Ja. Nee, webcast is het ook niet. Hmm. Ik ga die eens opnieuw praten. Ja, ja, doe maar. Ja, sorry. Ik stem desktop, ik ga zo eens proberen. Hè. Ja, klopt ja. Kan ik niet gewoon met een uh, mini-check? Uh, nee, dat kan niet. Oké, okay. dan ga ik nog eens proberen. Surfer searching in Google for flower piece. There we go. Well, look at that. The first result she get. Great. Now our explorer has a name, and we even have her mailing address. Our still on visitor is browsing the homepage. She's scanning through the themes of the new. Uh, collection, looking at the featured products and taking a closer look at the upcoming workshops. While she's doing all that, the personalization AI is using his magic. By using machine learning, the AI identifies different segments of visitors and tries to fit our visitor in one of those segments. The online shopper and the explorer. He or she is now looking at the latest inspiration from the blog and is showing an interest in the first article. There's a great step-by-step -step guide on how to make your own flower arrangements. And there we go. The AI has identified this visitor as an explorer. That's how long it takes. Our explorer gets to the end of the blog article and fills in a form to receive a free download. Oké, okay, ik ga naar hem. Ja, hij is er. Ja, hij is er. Oké. Ik ga het dus voor zo'n volgende ronde nu aan. Lukt het jou eventueel om de ja, boekje doen? Is het even die alles om zo hard mogelijk te zetten? Ja, maar ik kan het ook stilzetten. Ik zal het dan zelf vertellen. Heel goed. Ja. Ja? Is goed. Uh, nou, dan uh, heb ik voor de rest ook niks meer. Kijk, uh, succes in ieder geval. Dank u. Is dit leesbaar? Kijk eens aan zich. 
Het gaat hier gewoon werken. English, right? Are there people that don't, that, uh, don't speak Dutch? Because otherwise I can also do it in Dutch. English, okay, English it is. Okay, uh, yeah, with a little delay, so I'm going to really have to squeeze it in there. It's a presentation that normally takes an hour, and I was planned in half an hour, and now I've got like seven minutes of delay, so we're gonna, might be running fast, but keep your questions till the end. We have, I'll keep some time for that. First things first, um, as you know, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and uh, Drop Solid also has uh, people impacted by this war. Um, therefore, we are also working on a platform, Goods for Ukraine. Um, it's a platform created to help refugees all around Europe, also in the Netherlands, it's also very active, uh, to find missing supplies and people that have some extra stuff like we do, we can help them with that. So uh, take a look at it, put your stuff on there and they can really use it. Did you know that when customers are targeted with three personalized pages, conversion rates double, going from 1.7% to 3.4%. And then when they're exposed to 10 personalized page views, conversion rates jump. This is of course why all the big ones do it. But what is personalization? Because it sounds very fancy, but you, all of you know personalization. Uh, personalization is when you look at Spotify at the end of the year, you get your personalized report with the music that you like and maybe some other music that you also might like based on your preferences. Personalization is also Strava suggesting your routes based on the distance that you run, the location where you're at and things that you might like. Maybe other people that you know have done this route, uh, this is also personalization. But also the media that you consume, if you're looking at Netflix, they consume different videos they, sorry, they uh, recommend different videos to different people. They recommend different genres, different order of kind of videos. And even they personalize how the specific one video looks for you. So this is one video and these are all the specific teasers for this one video based on your preference. If you like horror, it will be, might be more bloody. If you are more into romantic movies, you might get a different teaser. Everything which you see in Netflix is a recommendation and 80% of their viewing numbers are recommendations, personal, personalized experiences. At Amazon, when you look at Amazon at the page, you also see that they also do personalization. When, when you've been looking at the sports watches, you also will get this bar of sports watches when you visit the front page. If you visit an item that you might not want to see in your feed, you can also, in the bottom, change your browsing history and remove these items from your personal preferences. These things are saved into a CDP, it's called a Customer Data Platform. They have one at Amazon and they will suggest products that you're interested in to, through the CDP. What do they save in the CDP? They save demographic data of your customer, where are you from, previous searches that you do, time that you used on specific pages, buying history if you're logged in, um, and other kinds of uh, details. They also activate this data by using a marketing automation platform. Once they know that you like the specific thing and they have your email address, they will send you a mail. You've been looking at this or, or you even added this to your car but you didn't come back. Please come back to the site and try to activate you. At DropSolid, we also been this kind of thing. I'm going to have to look sideways because the audio doesn't work, so I'm going to have to narrate it, but I don't see the video here, so let's see how this works. Okay. At DropSolid, we build something like this for Drupal, where we can do personalization on Drupal. Um, the customer website that we built is a hypothetical client, it's Florista. And Florista is a, a flower uh, company. And the, the person here is looking for a flower piece. So they come to the site via Google, they are looking for a flower piece. At RobSolid, at the, the Florista website, you see the front page on the left side, two nice blocks, on the right side, a nice block. Um, later on, you will see that the front page will be different. This is something that we do based on the preferences that we gather of the user. While the person is browsing, the personalization AI, which I will elaborate, is using its magic to determine which kind of user that we're looking at. 
she's looking at the workshops uh, and consuming the content. There's multiple segments that we have detected, so uh, we'll, we'll be trying to segment her in each of these segments. She's looking at this uh, workshop, great. She likes this content. And um, after some behavior, the AI has, has identified the person to be one or another segment, so we can then start to customize the web page behavior. But then she leaves her mail address to download some interesting tutorial. So now we have not only uh, the person's contact details, but also we know what kind of content she likes to consume on the website. Great. This allows us not only to personalize the website and the front page, but also to give them personalized emails. So if you see in the, the mail platform, we have our preferences, we have our picture, mail address, but also the, the, all the things that she did on the website, behaviors that they did, and emails that she received when she opened it, if she let it wait for so long, and all these kinds of details. And when you can then activate this, is in the mail platform, based on this preference, you can send different mails or, and here you see the front page where there's a block on the left side, because we know this person has interesting workshops, you can see a workshop blog and other kind of things. Sophia likes it, but she doesn't come back and she will now receive a mail. And in the mail, in Mautic, we can also, with the preferences also flow into the mailing system and then we can there, based on the preferences, put in different blocks so that the mail also looks different. So this is an example email where she, because she likes the workshop, there are some upcoming workshops in there, maybe some DIY things because we know she's an active user. Uh, this way we can give her a personalized experience, which is really cool. So, I'm going to go a step back. How do you do this? When you want to do personalization, you can say, okay, do we have a logged in user or not? If the user is logged in, do we have access to his or her or their personal data? Yes, then you can do advanced personalization or marketing automation. If the user is not logged in, then you need a cookie consent. You need a cookie consent for mar marketing automation and for personalization. If you have the consent, then you can do segmentation and marketing automation. If you have no consent, sorry, no cigar. Um, and then the maturity. So you can start with very small personalization. And I was talking, and uh, the title of the talk was hyper personalization. But what is hyper personalization? It sounds very fancy. And it's a term they cornered at Deloitte. And uh, they say, okay, you have single message mailing, you have field insertion when we like use people's data into an email. Very nice. Based on rules, segment users. So if you have profile data, you can based on these preferences show different content and it gets more and more advanced. And the moment you start going over this line of omni-channel optimization where your personal preferences flow to multiple systems, then they call it hyper-personalization. There's two um, ways of doing that. Uh, I always say there's two ways of looking at it. You have the side segmentation and marketing automation and on the other side authenticated personalization. First, I'm going to zoom in to authenticated personalization because that's very interesting these days uh, with the GDPR. Uh, GDPR, uh, as you know, limits how we can use people's data, uh, quite a lot even. But the, very recently there was a European Commission voted the Data Act um, which says that users will become more and more in control of their data. Uh, my data is mine was the original manifesto that they used and uh, this is going to be in practice really. Um, this got a, a little bit in the background in the media because um, the Russian invasion also happened in February and this really like was in the background. But what this act says is that when you have IoT devices at home, the data they generate can be yours because you're the owner of this device. And so these kind of things are in the data act that really put you as a user in control. This is like the tractors in the States that they cannot repair. This is what Europe is preventing. And they even call it, uh, the data act is a powerful engine for innovation and new jobs. It will allow the EU to ensure that we are at the forefront of the new innovation based on data. Uh, they want to really put the users in control. 
Now, what does this have to do with personalization? Well, we want to use people's data. Yeah? So, also relevant is the fair data economy model, which says that, okay, a person ha has uh, data which sometimes live in a data provider. For example, my driver's license, I don't have this source data at home. It's at the data provider, which is the government. But sometimes a data consumer might want to use this data for other things. So in this case of the fair data economy model, I have to, as a service provider or data consumer, as a website who wants to personalize, request consent to the user so that we can use the data from the government or other systems. This puts the user in control because they have the consent. Now, this is all very nice and has been done before, only it hasn't been done in a scalable way where this consent scales over multiple systems. So that's why they scale this one step further and they said, okay, we need a common rule book between all these operators where they do consent management. Uh, if I said, the um, this or this website can use my driver's license data to pre-fill data, I want this consent to be over multiple operators so they've changed operator, that is, I don't have to redo all the consents. It has to be standardized. So this is, um, make sure that your consent uh, is standardized over multiple systems. Um, and there are some really nice examples of this already in the wild. Decode, for example, is a European project which um, was for petitions and online voting for the civilians of Barcelona in a privacy-first way. So it's a, a really nice project. Why? Because as a citizen, you can share your data as in an anonymous way or only with the government or share it Time limited, so it's attribute based. You can share your data with specific people, with specific attributes in a specific way, which gives you really granular control over how your data is used. Also, as a data consumer or service provider, we can also request this data in a specific way so that only we can use it for this specific time amount uh, in a very controlled way. And we put the user in control of the data, but we get to use it. Um, another example is in Finland, Helsinki. Um, they cooperated with the Netherlands uh, for my data, uh, where also they created a um, consent management system to allow people to share driver's license and other uh, government data with service providers. In Belgium, we have the um, We Are ecosystem, which shares patient data with external systems. So patients are in control of their data and can allow it to be shared with other systems. Also in Belgium we have EasyMe, which is a, a federal government system where your notary acts. So if you have a house or if you have uh, other notary things that need to be officially, um, you can also share those documents from EasyMe. So it's also a kind of a data vault. And the Flemish government is really going to push hard on this. Solid is uh, Tim Berners-Lee's new system to have personal data pods where all this data lives and you can share it from there. And the Flemish government will really build on that to create personal data vaults, to have concept management, but not only for company, for persons, but also for companies and for, for like on an infrastructural layer so that we have an infrastructure to share this data with other systems. This is going to be the future of sharing your personal details. A company can say we provide your data as, an, as, an, as a citizen, I can share my details by just giving the consent or not giving the consent. And this way, you have a different experience. Some grants can be given automatically because they know if you give consent that you have access to this data because they can then use your details to fill in the forms automatically. These, will, these are things that will have impact to the people. Um, a French, French example, uh, one cup is a similar system that also does consent management. In the Netherlands, there is also IRMA, uh, which is also working on this. And uh, Octo is also uh, very nicely integrated uh, from the Netherlands, integrated with a lot of government systems already. So these are some cool examples to look at. So. This was about the logged in part where you can then request the data, get consent and really do the if else, if the person has two children, then you can do this. But there's the other part of the segment where people are not logged in and we might want to personalize the experience also for them. So this is about what I showed in the video, how can you do this? 
Uh, you need to do segmentation and personalization and then maybe some marketing automation after that. At Drop Solid, we have three main components which do this. Um, you have on the one side the content management part where content editors can say this content is for this segment and these kind of things. Then you have the CDP, which as in the Amazon example, where your preferences are saved so that we can show different mails or show different content based on the preferences. And then the marketing automation, which does the mail follow-up and the tracking and these kind of things. Um, why do you want this marketing automation in there? Because when people get personalized emails, which are interesting and relevant, not spam, they come back to your site for relevant content. And if this content website is then also giving you relevant content, this will reinforce. So this is really a flywheel effect or a reinforcement effect so that people really get to enact with the site and that you will have better flows and better conversion and yet better, uh, more profit for people that really want to interact with your site. Uh, this is an example flow of one of these, uh, one of these uh, marketing automation flows where people uh, if you're in this segment, you get this mail. If you're in another segment, you get this mail. When the mail is opened, add a point, and this way we get a profile of the user which has a lot of uh, interesting details. Over the multiple email flows, then you can really start making statistics. Or okay, this much people have uh, received the mail, this much people have uh, read it and have clicked, and so many people convert into the second follow-up email because they were interested in more products, and this way you can really get some nice statistics on these funnels. Other companies you already know are doing this as well. Um, why am I giving you this example? Because personally they annoy me really hard. Um, TripAdvisor really pushes these mails on me very hard. Don't overdo it. Yeah, so keep it sane, relevant and good for the end user. Then we're going to go in the CDP part, so the customer data platform part which allows us to do at a personalized front page uh, shown earlier. Therefore, we first need to find which segments are on our website. Therefore, we use the K-means clustering algorithm. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the algorithm that we apply to detect which, which segments are on the website. So we run this with multiple parameters so that it automatically gives you an overview of which kind of groups that are visiting your website. From this, we can then say, okay, transfer those to segments. And when these segments are live, we can then, and this is an example of it, we are people, we have people interested in content about pillows and beds, or we have people interested in buying. And when we can segment these users, then we can also personalize the content and give them a fast route to where they want to go. But we've add the AI to detect the segments, but then we will also need something to categorize the users. And this technically is the multi-layer perceptron that we use. So the moment people come to the website, we will track their behaviors. And through this multi-layer perceptron thing, we will say, okay, we think that this is a buyer, or we think that this is an applicant. And based on the, se the segment that we categorize them in, you can then in Drupal say, show them this content or show them that content or maybe put them in another mail group. Um, okay. On the content management part, um, we're using Drupal of course, uh, we're a very big Drupal company. Um, there we had some great changes on the user interface so we're still re really hard building on Rocketship. Rocketship is our install profile starter thing where you can start a really nice UXs with. Um, there is also work being done to pull this layout builder improvements into a separate module, which you can certainly check out. But for the personalization, go to the Drupal personalization for Rocketship and uh, Rocketship module. Um, and if you're interested in applying this yourself, certainly f find the workshop. We have multiple workshops, open personalization with Apache, you know me, and Mautic. And we do this at DrupalCon. But if you're interested, we will also give you a live demo um, in person or um, via Meet or whatever. So I think the main point I want to give you is the new GDPR legislation will allow us to really use personal data even much more. It will put the user in the driving seat and the control of their data, but it's on us to use it properly and to give Drupal 
allowed to use it. So where are you on the personalization curve and how do you want to get there? That's up to you. That's it. Really fast. <laughs> uh, within time, I have some time for questions. Yes, yes, yes. yes. No hesitation. So, um, have you had uh, testing and uh, with the people that the leads that uh, go to your site? Um, I hear a lot of people say, well, um, I go to this site and then uh, you personalize it and then you can just very quickly hit the uncanny valley thing that people uh, visit the site that they uh, feel that they're being watched because you recommend something yes. or uh, yes. something else that's uh, more with the uh, I think explorer type in mm -hmm. your uh, presentation that can have that feeling uh, and then you have to engage uh, at a later stage when they're more uh, conformable with, uh, with what you're uh, presenting on the yeah. site before you engage in the uh, personalization stage. Have you uh, have any experience with I that? Think, I think uh, what I always suggest when we're doing personalization is that it has to enrich your, um, enrich your experience. It doesn't need to like drill down so you only see personalized things. So mm -hmm. I would still use it as an enrichment to allow people to have some call to actions to go faster where they might want to go but otherwise they can use the site just like any other user so you don't fall into kind of a trap or a rabbit hole and so this way you have okay you will might if you're an applicant and you, you were looking for some jobs you might see an activation panel where you say yeah I'm still looking for a job if you're finding this relevant section of a company where you're really interested in what they're doing and then you want to like apply that might give you like the, the, the right place to go. Otherwise I wouldn't hide stuff there. Yeah. So I wouldn't uh, be hiding stuff and really like narrowing the the rabbit hole or, or the, the value that you are talking about. Is that an answer to your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I, there was another hand, another question. Um, well, I, I work at Drop Solid a year and a half now, and it's for, from before I was there. So there's a, it's running on multiple websites. We have partners uh, also outside of uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. So it's running on multiple websites. I'm not uh, sure on how many. Yes, and it was first, I will continue. Uh, can you apply this as well? Well, I think the, the, the main thing is you can use it for whatever end goal that you want. And the point is personalization. You can show people things that are relevant to the segment if you find whichever segment they're in. So if you're using it to build a community, you will have you will probably some metrics on that, on people, how they convert into a specific community. Or, and then I think this could be interesting. Yeah. But, Yes. Uh, see how Netflix is a little bit going um, overboard with their uh, personalization. How do you see a way to prevent falling for the trap of uh, believing too much in the algorithms instead of looking at what does your yeah. customer base actually want? That's a good question. Yeah, Netflix really goes hard with that. Huh? Uh, but I'm going to come back to what I said earlier is that it has to be an enrichment, it doesn't have to be like the only way because then you will quickly uh, go in, fall into specific categories and feel like narrowed down or limited and I think for like, a website or information providing it should be more like an enrichment than an addition. Is that an answer to your question? Sorry. Okay. It's 12 o'clock and I think this is the end. So uh, thanks again for your uh, time and if you have more questions, hit me up.